everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Divorce and Separation Coach podcast. Today, we're talking about what happens to children when a couple is separating, but they weren't married. To discuss this topic, I've invited Alexander Tribe, who's the founder and managing partner of Expatriate Law in London. Alexander specializes in English family law for international and high net worth families. But he's got over 20 years experience practicing law with extensive experience in international law, cohabitating disputes, prenups, civil partnership dissolutions, child residence and contact disputes. So really the whole lot. Thank you so much for joining us, Alexandra. Oh, thank you, Chloe. It's very kind of you to have me. So today I really wanted to try and understand a little bit better what happens when you aren't married and you have children together. And, you know, especially when people get to separating, if they separate, what happens in that context? So at a high level, could you tell us what is the difference with, you know, between couples who are cohabitating and those who are married with regards to the rights they've got upon separation? Mm. So there's lots of differences um, for married couples and unmarried couples when separating in, to do with the finances. What financial claims can be made? Um, and I'll touch upon that when we discuss this morning. Um, but importantly, there is really very little difference in the the children side of things in terms of the arrangements for the children uh, after after separation. Um, the parents have the same rights uh, over their children um, as unmarried as married parents. Um, the difference, though, is for married parents, the father um, will automatically obtain parental responsibility when the parents are, if the parents are married when a child is born. But for unmarried couples, that automatic right isn't there. Um, the father would need to obtain parental responsibility either through um, being present at the registration at the birth and having his name on the birth certificate or obtaining parental responsibility at a later date. Now, that can either be um, through a, a parental responsibility agreement or it could be through an application to the court. But parental responsibility is important because um, it, it allows a parent to auto, um, operate their, their rights uh, concerning the child. And that parental responsibility is needed if there is going to be an application to court um, for contact, for example, or a lives with order or something like that. So if they didn't have that established, then you may not have any rights to see the child after the separation? They certainly would. Um, and they can exercise those rights by requesting contact with the child from the mother uh, and perhaps using the help of a mediator or um, some sort of amicable resolution. But if all that fails, then they would need to make an application to the court. And the court um, would look at all the circumstances and the welfare of the child when, when making a decision as to the right level of contact. But that parental responsibility is important because it's needed to be able to make that court application. So sometimes the application for PR is the preliminary step. Okay. So you, you mentioned a court application. Is that the process for making child arrangements when there isn't a, you know, a, a marriage in place? Um, whether there is a marriage or not, uh, court is an option. But to be honest, it should really be the very last resort. There are loads of different options for resolving children disputes, and there should they, these issues should be capable of resolution without involving the court. The, the, the law, the children law, actually has a no order principle. So the yeah. court really doesn't want to get involved unless there is a dispute between the parents that can't be resolved. So I know in some other countries, as part of divorce or separation, the court would automatically make decisions about who the child would live with and how much contact there would be with every, each parent. That's not the same in England. The court really doesn't want to get involved unless there's a proper dispute. So on separation, um, a, a brilliant way to do it is to sit down with your partner uh, and to try and reach an agreement about how arrangements for your child are, are going to take place. And you can put that in a parenting plan um, there are many free parenting plans uh, available. Um, I really love um, the one from my family wizard. 
yeah, which is a, an online solution for, for separating parents. There's a yearly fee for use of the service, but I think it's brilliant. It's really thorough and it guides them through all the different issues concerning a child that they may not have thought about, like what should we do when it's a, a, our child's birthday? Who who will spend that day and Christmas and meeting the grandparents and, and all these issues? If these are discussed really early on separation and you both put in, in place your clear intention, you're really more likely to stick to that in the future, which is great because children benefit when courts are not involved. Absolutely. But, I mean, it sounds like really exactly the same process as if you had been married you need Absolutely. to sort that out and the court wants ideally for the family to work that through in the best possible way for their children rather yeah, than having to absolutely. make decisions and and also something to consider is um it is parenting support there mm -hmm. are some amazing um parenting coaches and um support available for separating parents to yeah. um help them make child focused decisions uh concern, concerning their children's lives which i think is excellent way forward absolutely and also help them as you were mentioning you know in the parenting plan making sure that they anticipate the kind of things they should be documenting and discussing at this stage mm -hmm. and having those kind of provisions included to avoid any kind of disputes later on yeah absolutely uh, and and using there are lots of different apps for arranging um pickups and drop-offs of children my family was it is just one but there's lots of others and these can be really good because they so save endless emails back and forth and i find that 10 parents tend to behave better when using those apps um because there's a, a feeling that well you know everything i say is 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 going to be in a written down form i'm going to rephrase that and and you know, suggest this alteration in a nicer way. Yeah. And that helps keep keep those arrangements on track. Yeah. I think our family wizard has a, a little AI element to it that tells you the wording isn't great. You might want to rethink. Yeah, which is great. You know, those, are, Absolutely. Those, those kind of apps are helpful. You know, it's not necessarily just for high conflict. You know, even if you can get on and, and, and discuss things properly, it's still a central place to have all the information. You can track expenses. So they're all really really a helpful tool for anybody who needs to co-parent no matter what the context mm, um, now that for the for those who are more a bit concerned so you know you mentioned parenting plans when you're divorcing you have the option of getting a child arrangement order is that option still there if you haven't been married yes absolutely uh, uh it, it's the, the same route for a married and unmarried uh couple that's for the arrangements for the child for example um who the child will live with and how much holiday time the child will spend with the other parent and overnight stays and pickups from school, things like that. Yeah. That doesn't include the financial aspects. That's just the arrangements for the child, for the care and, and um, you know, those kind of things. The financial aspects are dealt with under different areas of law and um, those are where the big differences come in between married and unmarried couples. Actually, we have a, a podcast scheduled with Oscar Smith and your team to discuss exactly that. So these two will go hand in hand with this one really focused on the children and the other one talking about the finances, yeah. even though they are, you know, there's relationships between the two and they're hard to separate completely. Um, so if they if the couple does want to find them a legally or create a legally binding document, they can still have a child arrangement order yes no they certainly they can um often uh, if if they if they make an application to court it can be an amicable application to court um the judge is likely to want to to um see both parties just because there is a a, a safeguarding element in the decision that the, the judge makes um and that's to protect both parents and the child um okay. the, the, the court wouldn't want a situation where they they weren't aware that one parent was being bullied into a, a, arrangements for a, ch a child that they weren't happy and secure with. So the court will step in and, and take a supervisory role to ensure that the arrangements are in the best interest of the child. But it, if agreed, it can be a very smooth process. Of course, people can use a family mediator, for example, to, to find those arrangements and, and make sure that they are you know, acceptable for everybody. Absolutely. And mediation is brilliant when involving children issues. 
um, it helps to take the heat out of um, any dispute on separation. Uh, another option to avoid court um, is arbitration. So arbitration is available now for children proceedings and it mimics the court route, but it allows the, the couple to um, resolve these issues in a more discreet way. Mm -hmm. um, they can choose together the child arbitrator that they want to use, who acts as the, the judge. Um, they, they can choose the speed by which the process um, goes ahead. They can instruct their own independent social worker in, mm -hmm. instead of using the court-led CAFCAS team. And this can be really good for international couples where um, they may be living overseas and, and can't travel back to England. Um, but, but also for those who want to avoid the stress of a court attendance, where there can be lots of waiting around, it's quite a stressful environment. Um, so I find arbitration a really sensible way of dealing with things. Also, you then have the continuity of that same arbitrator being involved throughout the whole process, rather than sometimes at court, you may have a different judge from, from one yeah. time to the next. Um, and, and long um, periods of time between one hearing and the next. So with arbitration, you can work together with your legal teams to res resolve these issues in a way that suits both of you. So I'm a big fan of arbitration. Yeah, that, I was going to say that, that controlling the timeline is an important aspect as well, given the backlog within the courts. But if you're, you know, arbitration gives you the advantage of being able to proceed faster. Yeah. Um, although, it, just to, for, for those listeners who aren't very familiar with mediation and arbitration, just to explain that arbitration is still a, as you said, it mimics the court process. So it's still a judge or an arbiter in this case that makes the decision. So it's a different yes. approach to um, mediation where you're jointly building a, an agreement. Um, it is delegating that decision, but to somebody you've chosen in a context that you're, you've got a little bit of control. Yeah, that's quite right. And the arbitrator is usually um, a, a, a judge or a, um, a, a very senior barrister who specializes mm -hmm. in, in this case, children proceedings. Yes. Um, and the resulting arbitration agreement will then be transferred into a court order at the end. So you will have a, a binding court order but it's just through this different arbitration scheme. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier the rights that come from having parental responsibility. Are there any obligations that come along with that as well? Um, parents often ask me this. Is there anything I can do to push my partner to see my child? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately not. Yeah. The, 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 both parents have a right to see the child but there is nothing that can be done to force them. If they yeah. don't turn up for scheduled agreements, then um, it will impact on the welfare of the child. And that may impact on decisions that are made for future contact or holiday yeah. and things like that. But there's nothing can be done to force a parent to attend for contact. Yeah. So the, the, there are other obligations that are financial, that yeah. are, are are related to a child, but um, but but those are different from from the children side of things. Yeah, but well, that's a good question. Actually, I was going to ask you about that. You know, child maintenance, which is usually a pretty big area for conversation and debate in, in a divorce, is that also potentially due even if there hasn't been a marriage? Yes, it absolutely is. And um, under if if they were married, um, there are other financial claims that can be made as well as child maintenance, yes. spousal maintenance for the wife, for example, pension shares and, and division of assets. But for unmarried couples, they have two routes. And I know Oscar will discuss this in, in more detail when you see him, but, but very uh, briefly, there is a, a children application, an application for financial support for a child, which can be used for unmarried couples which is a, a claim under Schedule 1 of the Children Act. And that allows maintenance for a child and it, it can provide housing for that parent and child whilst the child is a minor. So, yeah. for example, depending on the financial resources of the party, for example, the father can be ordered to 
purchase a home for the, the mother to live in with the child while the child is is young. And then yeah. that property reverts back to the father uh, after the, the child has grown up. And other claims that are available under Schedule 1 are uh, uh, you can claim a lump sum mm -hmm. to, for example, buy a new cot or a car to transport the child to school, these kind of things. But the, the financial claims under Schedule 1 are really limited compared to those on divorce. Um, but the other option is, uh, and sometimes these are used in conjunction, if the couple have been living together in a family home owned by one party, then the, um, the, the party that doesn't own the home can consider a claim under a separate area of law called TOLATA, yeah. uh, which is the Trust of Land and Appointment of Trustees Act, which allows them to potentially claim a share of that home. But again, Oscar will, will explain in more detail. So there are financial options if you're unmarried, um, but unfortunately they are much more limited than those under divorce. And important yeah. to point out that um, there is no such thing um, as the, the, for a couple living together. Um, sometimes they think that if they've lived together for a period of time, then they are treated as a married couple. Yeah, that doesn't exist. You're either married or unmarried. Mm -hmm. um, but from an international aspect, bear in mind that these claims are also possible, mm -hmm. potentially for some couples who are living overseas, if one couple lives overseas and the other one in England, and in various other situations, yeah. the English court can step in to make these financial orders. I would imagine that actually that might be a big consideration for people uh, in terms of which country's jurisdiction they they, they choose if they have the choice, uh, because I, I would imagine from one country to another, these kind of issues get treated slightly differently. And so yeah, there, it's important might be some that are more because favorable. You're, you're right. The, the, in some countries, there are no financial claims available for an unmarried couple. For mm -hmm. example, um, in parts of the Middle East, in, in Dubai, for example, it's not possible to apply to the courts for child maintenance because yeah. um, of, of the difficulty in recogni recognizing um, the, the legitimacy of, of a child where the parents were unmarried. So yeah. in those cases, if the parents, one parent is British, it can be essential to have the fallback of the English court. Yeah. Um, so th those are interesting cases to deal with. But just to clarify, though, so the, the financial obligations that exist in case of separation are only towards the child, not towards the other person in the couple. You're right. That, You're that right. Yeah. And sometimes a claim under Schedule 1 can include elements of the mother's expenses mm -hmm. when those are experiment expenses are very much linked to the care of the child. OK, they're still linked to the child. Yeah. yeah. So if they wasn't a child, they wouldn't be allowed to those kind of claims. No, not a claim under Schedule 1. Um, they're, they're, the the Talata claims are available for unmarried couples um, without children. Um, but again, again the, these, this, this is a, an area of law that really needs modification um, because, because people don't necessarily understand what, these, what their rights are or lack of rights until it's too late. You were talking earlier, you know, about common law marriage and this idea that if you've yeah. been together long enough, you're protected. I think that's one of the misconceptions that's very much out there. And so for cohabitating couples who come to separate, they sometimes it's a very harsh realization mm -hmm. that they aren't entitled to as much as if, as if they had been married. So mm -hmm. is there anything they can do up front? You know, if, imagine a cohabitating couple who is having a child together but is not marrying. What what can they put in place ahead of time to try and protect themselves in case they, they break up later on? Well, there's plenty that can be done um, and it requires consideration early. Mm -hmm. um, if possible, un, uh, unmarried pa parents, um, couples, if they've made a decision to live together unmarried, have that discussion about oh, what's going to happen about our future finances because Unmarried couples work together for their financial futures just as 
that married couples do. Really? Our married couples equally think of a financial future together. But there's less of this um, a, a, a regulatory concept to allow them to, to sit back and relax about it because the law isn't there to allow them to make claims that they could on, on divorce. So it's important for if, if couples are not married and are deciding to live together long term unmarried or even short term, have a discussion about the, the financial input of both of you and mm -hmm. how you want your financial future to look and yeah. then consider whether it's it's sensible to enter into an agreement to set out how the, these these issues are going to be dealt with for example you may live in a in a home which belongs to the man or belongs mm -hmm. to the woman what what is going to happen to the contributions of the other party to that home yeah for example, in terms of renovations or contributions to mortgage and other expenses, how are those going to be recorded and reflected in the future if you separate? Mm -hmm. um, the other the other side is if you're having a child together, well, what what will happen in the future if you separate? These issues can be considered before a child is born. Yeah. And it's difficult to discuss, uh, just as prenuptial agreements are difficult to discuss. Mm -hmm. But if they are discussed and something is put down in writing and drafted up by a lawyer, then it can make all the difference at the time of separation yeah. if if that does happen. Um, and it's important that that both couple, the both parties have financial disclosure and explain to each other and show to each other what finances and assets and income they have. Um, it's important that both have independent legal advice. Yeah. It's important that they don't feel pushed into the agreement. And um, and then those those agreements can place have significant weight at a later date if mm -hmm. separation happens. Um, so it's similar to a prenup, really, what you're describing. It's similar to a prenup, and there's lots of um, different ways, different uh, ways they can be called um, cohabitation agreements, separation agreements. Uh, sometimes they're called known ups uh, for those that aren't getting married. But but get legal advice, get it down on paper. It, it's not too expensive to do, and it can make a considerable difference for separating couples. I mean, the main problem is actually just people not really wanting to have to discuss those things at that stage yeah. uh, and, and just accepting that it's a painful conversation, but it's worth having because it protects you for later on. Yeah. And, and can those can those arrangements include child care arrangements as well? So agreements about who would keep the child if they were to separate? Those, they, they, those are less binding because okay. always the court has to have the upper hand to decide, is this arrangement in the best interest of the child? Yeah. So yes, those kind of um, uh, 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 those terms can be considered, but there is an unlikely to be considerable weight placed on them if it's yeah. not in the best interest of the child. Yeah. So sense. it's it, it's better for these uh, these agreements to be more focused on the financial aspects because mm -hmm. for separating couples at, who are unmarried, often at the time of of separation. These potential financial claims that can be made under Schedule 1 or to LATA come as a real shock to the financial yeah. stronger party. Even if the claims are more limited on divorce than, than on divorce, they're still a shock. Mm -hmm. And they can cause considerable acrimony. For example, where one party has inherited a home from his, fam his or her family. Yeah. And there's the feeling of, oh, I have no idea this home could potentially be shared with someone I'm not married to yeah so, and it could be even more emotive than non-divorce so that's why early advice is really important yeah, yeah I think that makes sense so if, having first of all those conversations as a couple 
even if you're not making anything legally binding, just so that you're on the same page around what, what you think will happen and how you would want things to, to unfold if you were to break up. Even sometimes, even with married couples, you know, thinking through how you would want to handle the divorce if you were if yeah. you were to divorce later on, yeah. just having that that set out at a time where you're not hostile and, uh, yeah. and, and angry at each other. Uh, but then also getting that legal advice so that you are informed and you can try and prevent any, any of the downsides of, of not being married from a legal perspective. And having these conversations at an early stage is good because it sets the precedent for your future relationship together. Yeah. Um, and you, you've gone on a path where you're being financially open with the other party. Mm -hmm. And so that behavior is more likely to continue through the relationship. Yeah. So if separation does happen or wobbles happen, you know, that's like, that's going to, to be, you know, we're going to be on ups and downs through relationships. But if you've had financial openness, then you'll both be in much better position. Great. Right. Uh, it'll make everything a lot smoother if there was a breakup, if else would have So what would you be your top three tips? This is my traditional final question. Um, you know, for a couple who is not married, but who is having a child um, and, you know, are, are you know, want to want to protect themselves for the future in, in case it's never arranged. What would be their three your three tips to them? Um, I would say firstly, get some legal advice so that you know where you are and what you're entitled to. That's really important at an early stage because you may be panicking about um, about what's happening, about the home you're living in, and knowing your rights is really important. Just getting even an hour's advice will put you in good stead. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it, try and um, assemble the relevant information that you might need. What contributions have you made financially to your relationship and to mm -hmm. uh, the home in which you live? Have you made any um, uh, interior decorations or structural changes or have you contributed financially in any way? Try and get this information together, write it down provide supporting documentation that will really help your lawyer at the time of your meeting mm -hmm. and thirdly an important issue is if at the time of separation you are feeling um, under threat uh, for example that your partner is is um, using or threatening violence towards you saying this is my home you must get out. Consider that there are legal options to help you and protect you. Even for unmarried couples, there are options for, for very difficult situations to obtain a non-molestation order to prevent a partner from you using or threatening violence or an occupation order even to secure your right to stay in the home until um, a, a, a final solution has been reached or even exclude a partner from the home. So get advice early for, for these issues. You don't have to live with threats of violence um, or, or, or controlling behavior. Get advice on, on your entitlements. Right to know that those protections exist, that it, they don't take into consideration your marital status, that they're there to, to protect people in any kind of abusive situation. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Alexander. It's been really interesting. And I'm looking forward to the conversation with Oscar as well on the financial side of things. And hopefully this has given a lot of useful tips and information to people who aren't married, but who might be having children or already have them. Oh, and want to make sure that they're thank you. thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great day. Oh, thanks, Chloe. Bye.